We're continuing on in our sermon series going through the book of Mark. If I haven't had a chance to meet you, my name is Brandon. I'm uh, the senior pastor here. And so excited to be here with you this morning. And and as I was thinking about a way into the passage, um, our world has a lot of different beliefs about afterlife. Would you agree with me on that? And I think this time of year, especially like at the corner house near my neighborhood, the guy or the people who are decorating their house have like a really twisted view um, of afterlife. And there's like grave scenes and weird people with nasty faces coming out of the graves on his grass. And then like three, three or four weeks from now, it'll be like Santa Claus or whatever. But, um, you know, recently in America, in our, in our culture, zombies have come, and have come back or they've actually taken prominence. Um, there's several different shows about zombies. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen The Walking Dead. It's kind of like a, like a big thing in, a, in American culture. Um, I don't think I've watched an episode of it, so I can't say anything about it as far as like whether or not it's good. But the idea is, though, it's, it's about zombies who have come back, and they're literally the walking dead. And the reason why I mentioned zombies is because, um, again, humans, we have a really interesting way of thinking about humans who have come back to life in a certain sense. And zombies, their brains aren't very like developed, and all they know how to do is to chase down other humans and... You can finish the rest of the story there um, because some of you haven't had breakfast or lunch doesn't sound appealing after that. But, all right, afterlife, our country, our culture, and other cultures all over the world, they have interesting views about afterlife. And that really is the question that's driving the opposition here today. And the title of my message is, Ignorance Isn't Always Bliss, all right? Think about someone in the back going, always, it isn't always bliss. Because sometimes, I guess, ignorance could be bliss. But in the case of the Sadducees, we have Jesus telling them that they have been ignorant about a couple things. And they are actually in error for being ignorant and clearly mistaken. So we're going to go through our passage here today in Mark chapter 12. If you didn't flip there yet, we're continuing. But let's have that thought of the afterlife in mind because that's the driving question or the driving idea. Then the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to him with a question. Teacher, they said, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife but no children, the man must marry the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first one married and died without leaving any children. The second one married the widow, but he also died, leaving no children. It was the same with the third. In fact, none of the seven left any children. Last of all, The woman died too. Now at the resurrection, (laughs) whose wife will she be since the seven were married to her? Now, (laughs) you know me, I like voices, right? But if you don't read it in that, and I love how Susan did the air quotes, right? Because they don't believe in the resurrection. So this this is them coming to Jesus like basically being idiots, trying to trap him, trying to make him look like an idiot in front of the whole temple crowd. And so the Sadducees, who are these people? Well, they were a politico-religious party within Judaism. And they're really the main competitors of the Pharisees. So interesting, last week the Pharisees and the Herodians come and they try to trap Jesus. Remember, it's a trap. That's what Pastor Daniel shared last week. All right, they rivaled with them politically and theologically. Now, there's not much known about them since none of their writings are still, or that none of their writings are extant, or that we can't find any of their writings. But they most likely arose from a priestly aristocracy that supported the Hasmonean dynasty after the Maccabean revolt. So if you don't know a lot about Jewish history, that's okay. But the Maccabees came in and they overthrew the pagan, um, uh, the, the people who were uh, residing in Jerusalem. They threw them out and they established a royal dynasty. And, that's, and when they did, the people waved palm branches when they came into the town. And that's why Jesus, when he came in, they were wa- waving branches as well, thinking there's another kingdom that's going to overthrow the pagan invaders. And after that time, there was a priestly aristocracy that rose to power and this is where they say the Sadducees must have come from during this time and the name Sadducees comes from the priestly line of Zadok that's what people think it it might come from Zadok who was the great high priest during the reigns of King David and then his son King Solomon Z-A-D-O-K and the Sadducees Zadok Sadducees so it's kind of maybe follows that line it's probably the the best way we can trace their name back 
So here's my cool joke. The Sadducees denied the resurrection, the final judgment, and the existence of the soul after death. And so they were sad, you see, because there was no hope for them after death. All right. You will remember that, right? Now the Pharisees, they loved the law, and they would look at things and go, that's not fair. I see it differently. Um, it, yeah, ha, 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 yeah. Roller skates at drive-ins, okay? Just one of the, no, Sadducees, okay? But you will remember that. They were sad, you see, because there was no afterlife for them. There was no resurrection. There was no future hope after the grave. No final judgment, all right? So they were different. And the Pharisees believed in all that. And that's why they were theological rivals, the Pharisees were pretty on, poor, on par with everything. And, and we're going to get to one more interesting thing about them is um, they only accepted what we call the law or the Mosaic law, which is the first five books of the Old Testament. So the Sadducees, they thought that was inspired scripture, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They thought everything else was not inspired by God. And so probably why they didn't understand the resurrection or hold to it because there's a lot of texts after the first five books that speak about the resurrection. Specifically in the second temple literature, and you can find that in Daniel. We're going to go through that here in a little, sec- in a little bit later on today. Now politically, they're associated with the priestly leadership in Jerusalem, the high priest and the Sanhedrin. So these were like upper class kind of aloof, away elitists. They thought they had more power than the people. Now the Pharisees were hanging out in Galilee by the common folk, and that's why Jesus had opposition when his ministry was in Galilee, but now he's at the temple in Jerusalem, and this is where the high, powerful priestly group, the the Sadducees, now they're intensely opposing Jesus. Jesus received opposition from the Pharisees out with the common people, and now that he's in the place of leadership near the Sanhedrin and the high priest, the Sadducees come at him, And now they're going to go and they're going to question a couple things of Jesus. They were actually um, probably conservative, not in the 2022 American conservative slash liberal spectrum. It was more they wanted to conserve the traditions of Moses, the first five books. They wanted to keep the status quo. They weren't necessarily anti-Rome. And they weren't waiting and hoping for a Messiah to come and overthrow the Roman Empire. Very different from the Pharisees, okay? You're starting to understand that. If you don't know much about the Pharisees, do a Google search or go back and look at one of our last 38 sermons. We talked about them quite a bit. So what do they do? They come and they talk to them about what's called a leveret marriage. And if you have your Bibles open, flip to Deuteronomy. Again, it's really easy to find. And if you're a Sadducee, you know exactly where it is because they study the first five books of the Bible. Deuteronomy 25. The book of Deuteronomy is, means the second law, and this is the time that Moses is giving the law the second time to the people of Israel before they go across the Jordan River in to, to take over the promised land. 25 verse 5. If brothers are living together and one of them dies without a son, his widow must not marry outside the family. Her husband's brother shall take her And marry her and fulfill the duty of a brother-in-law to her. The first son she bears shall carry on the name of the dead brother so that his name will not be blotted out from Israel. However, if a man does not want to marry his brother's wife, she shall go to the elders at the town gate and say, My husband's brother refuses to carry on his brother's name in Israel. He will not fulfill the duty of a brother-in-law to me. Then the elders of his town shall summon him and talk to him. If he persists, saying, I don't want to marry her, His brother's widow shall go up to him in the presence of the elders, take off one of his sandals, spit in his face, and say, This is what is done to the man who will not build up his brother's family line. That man's line shall be known in Israel as the family of the unsandaled. Apologize for giggling, but I just just thinking about that is a lot. We're, we're removed from that, okay? And if and if you're not a Jew, that probably was never part of your story, okay? But here, what what is he getting at? They're talking to Jesus here in Mark chapter twelve, and he's using that, right? The Sadducees said Moses wrote for us this law, and then he comes up with the hypothetical story. But he's talking about a levirate marriage from Deuteronomy chapter twenty five. But what was the point of all that? The command was written so that the family line of the deceased would continue. 
How many of you ever try to read the New Testament in like a certain amount of time and you open up the book of Matthew and you're like, I'm so excited to read. And then you start going, this person begat, this person begat, this person. Then you say, I'm going to beget my way out of the Bible, okay? (laughs) Family lines meant everything to Jewish people, right? To trace back to where you were in the tribes, right? I think I can go four or five people back in my family and then I'm horrible, okay? I just missed the mark. But the name of the deceased man would not be blotted out from Israel if his brother would marry the widow, have a child, and then dedicate that child in the name of the brother who had passed. So that is what they're asking about. All right, so what's, what are they doing? Here, here's the point if you want to fill it in. The Sadducees, they're attempting to trap Jesus with an absurd story to discredit his authority and to ridicule the resurrection. Okay, the story is absurd for several reasons. First, they didn't even believe in the resurrection. So the fact that they're asking him a resurrection question just shows the absurdity. And he's saying basically to Jesus, look, if you believe in this resurrection, it's going to lead to very, very ridiculously complicated marital situations in the afterlife. Who's... Whose husband will be given to? Who, who's going to be her husband? She's had seven. Oh, if there's a resurrection, right? Who's going to be? And even polygamy. Is she going to have seven husbands in the resurrection, Jesus? We know that's not about the Mosaic law, right? So they're trying to, to basically discredit his authority and then ridicule the resurrection. This actually has several different parallels in kind of sub-biblical literature other than Bible documents from that time where, where seven brothers, there's a couple different stories. If you're like a history buff, you can go and search like where does this kind of echo other things. And so there's a bunch of different things and, and ways people look at this. But the biggest thing here is that like, look, this is absurd. They don't believe in it. They're trying to get Jesus, make him look like an idiot in the temple. And they're trying to basically say the resurrection is a very, just, it's an illogical doctrine. It's worthless, right? Here we are seeing another group sent to question his authority. Two weeks ago, he's in Jerusalem. Remember, now that he's come to Jerusalem, this is the last week of his life. The chief priests and the teachers of the law ask him a question about imperial tax Actually, that was last week, the, two weeks ago, like, well, John, John's baptism, was it, was it from God or was it from humans, right? By what authority are you doing these things? Last week, the Pharisees and the Herodians came in and they tried to question him on the imperial tax. So if he said the wrong thing, he could, he could be thrown into prison or he could be executed by cash, capital punishment for going against the Roman Empire. And here we have the Sadducees trying to make him look stupid and try to ridicule the doctrine of the resurrection, which if you've been tracking with us for 38 weeks, he's already said three times that he will rise from the dead. So he already firmly believes in the resurrection. He's actually claiming his own resurrection, which if you believed in the resurrection is going to be mind-boggling because they thought that it was at the very end of this age and marked the coming of the new age. And so if Jesus says, I will rise here, not on the very last day, but I will rise here, meaning that God is doing something new to start his plan now, which that's where Christians latch on to and we run with that, okay? Next week, we're going to see a teacher of the law come again with another question. Jesus, which commandment is the greatest? Right? And he will answer them, and the guy will be, he'll be astonished, and Jesus will tell him, you're not far from the kingdom of God. All right. The ridiculous story, again, meant to wily ridicule this, this, or meant to ridicule the wily hell belief in the resurrection. So how does Jesus respond? So when the Pharisees and the Herodians questioned him on the, on the imperial tax, his answer was like really clever, right? It was kind of mysterious. He goes, well, well, give me a coin. Well, whose image is on that coin? Well, it's Caesar's. Well, give it to Caesar's then. It belongs to Caesar's, but give, give to God what belongs to God. He doesn't commit right? Sedition. He doesn't commit treason against the Roman Empire. And then he also doesn't commit idolatry by saying, yeah, have these coins with other images on it. He says, well, that's just Caesar, so give it to him. In other words, you are stamped with the image of God, so give your full life to God. Here, though, he's very blunt. He's very clear. He's explicitly direct. He's in their face, and he answers them and rebukes them. And here's his response. Jesus replied, Are you not in error because you don't know the scriptures or the power of God? And people in the background are like, oh, sorry. All right. Let's go. When the dead rise, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. Now about the dead rising, have you not read in the book of Moses? 
in the account of the burning bush, how God said to him, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are badly mistaken! Exclamation mark. So that's why, that's why I raised my voice there. That's just what I do. Here's his double rebuke. The first one is he rebukes them because of the ignorance of the power of God. Some of you are going to say, wait, he said scripture first and then power of God. Yeah, but then he addresses the power of God and then goes back to scripture. So I'm just going to follow his, his uh, understanding here. So the power of God. Why are they ignorant? He's saying, look, resurrection life is not a continuation of earthly life. Resurrection life is not resuscitation life. This isn't like Lazarus where he was died and he came back to life and continued to walk and live with the, and hang out with the sisters, right? This is not res- resuscitation life. This isn't come back to life and keep on living. This is a totally different thing. You will be raised and transformed to be like the angels. And Luke says that the Sadducees don't even believe in the angels. So this is like a double, like, you just don't know. Like, you don't know the power of God and you don't even believe in angels. So let me school you here for a second. Now, this be like the angels. Angels have different functions and destinies than humans. I don't want to take a whole, you know, two hours to talk about an angelology or a theology of angels, but humans are very different than angels. And I don't want to step on anyone's toes, but when someone that we love dies, no, heaven does not get another angel. Because humans are made different than angels. They reflect the glory of, the glory of God differently. They're made in the image of God, and I don't think angels are made in the image of God. There's a difference here. The function of an angel, which he's getting at, is angels don't exist to procreate. When God made human beings in his likeness and his image, what does he say? He doesn't say, go and pray to me. He says, no, go be fruitful and multiply, right? I want you to populate the earth. I want you to continue to make more of my image bearers on the earth. And so when it says they won't, be, they won't marry or be given in marriage, it's meaning like they're, they're going to be like the angels in that they don't need to continue the human race any further, there's no need for procreation. He doesn't say there will be no marriage. Like, and this is what I was kind of wrestling with and I'm thinking about it. Like, he never says that those people will be raised and not be married if they were married before, right? Because this is all about the widow who doesn't have a child and the brother who's died who can't pass on his family name throughout the ages. And so he's saying they're not going to marry, which that would be the man searching out a wife and or be given in marriage or the woman who is given in marriage to the man because there's no need to procreate if you're like the angels. If you're, in a sense, immortal, you're raised to the place of resurrection life. Then he says, the second rebuke is, you just don't know the scriptures. And probably they didn't think that some of the scriptures were inspired. Because he says when you don't know the scriptures, he says it's pretty clear in Daniel chapter 12, he says... And verses 1 through 3, at that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people will arise and there will be a time of distress as has not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people, everyone whose names is found written in the book will be delivered. And here's the key text on resurrection from the book of Daniel. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who led many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. That's one out of many Old Testament texts that talk about the resurrection, and it's really clear. But again, the Sadducees, they don't think that that text is inspired. So he's saying, you don't even know the scriptures. But rather than quoting Daniel, what does he do? He goes to a book from Moses, right? Exodus chapter 3. If you have your Bibles, flip there. One of my favorite stories of all time. Exodus chapter 3. If you're new to your Bibles, it's really easy. Open it up. You find Genesis. Go to 51 pages to the right. You'll find Exodus. Then go two more pages and you'll be at Exodus chapter 3. Pretty close. Mine says 54. But depending on if you have a title page in there, a whole, you know, big chunk just says Exodus. It could be around 54 or 55, somewhere like that. If you have really small font, it's on page 3,222. Actually, it'd be on page one, sorry. All right. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. He led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire within a bush. 
Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. And when the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. My sons love it when I do that voice, by the way. And he said, here I am. Don't come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And at this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Jesus' commentary on this passage is basically saying, look, they have a continued relationship with God because of his covenant faithfulness and his grace to extend the covenant. And he is not the God of the dead. He is the God of the living. In other words, those guys aren't dead as if like dead and gone forever. They're, they aren't done in their existence. They are somehow in relationship with God. And you guys understand that because that's one of the books. And just let me show you the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's still in covenant relationship. It didn't just go when they passed. So the dead will rise. I wonder if he made any like weird voices to them at this point. <laughs> one of the last things I want to mention before we get into some of the application for us he says, you are badly mistaken. When have we seen Jesus say that to anyone thus far? And by the way, this is the first time the Sadducees show up in Mark and the last time they show up in Mark. <laughs> They're probably like, oh, wow, we just got humiliated and discredited. When, was, when did he speak to someone and say, you are badly or horribly or mistaken greatly, if depending on your translation, greatly mistaken? Jesus is trying to show the importance of the resurrection. And I think what he's trying to say is don't be wrong about the resurrection. Don't be ignorant about it. Again, it's not bliss in their case. Ignorance isn't bliss if you miss the resurrection. Don't be wrong about the resurrection. So here's kind of one of your first take-home points is that the resurrection is central to the Christian faith. The doctrine of the resurrection is central to the Christian faith. If you have your Bibles, flip to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're going all over the Bible today. Hopefully you're okay with that. Some of you might say, why doesn't he ever put the verses up on the screens? Because I want you to know where they are in this, because you don't have the screens at home. Right? That wasn't satisfactory for some of you, but okay. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 15. If you want to know about the resurrection, read the whole chapter. I'm going to pull out little chunks of this, but look at chapter 15, verse 17. No, I guess verse 16. Okay, verse 15. We'll start in verse 15. Okay, let's start in verse 12. Okay. But if it is preached that Christ is raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. More than that, if we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead... But he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And, it raised either. and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those who also have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all others." In a way, Paul is saying, like, if you're going to say that Christ isn't raised from the dead, then, then what are we doing here? Our faith is worth, worthless. His preaching. He didn't go around and preach, you're a sinner, you need to turn from your sins. He went and preached, you, Christ has been raised from the dead, and in his resurrection has canceled out all those other things in your life. They went around telling the good news that Jesus is alive. He died on the cross and he actually rose from the grave and he is alive. And in his resurrection can offer eternal life for those who put their faith and trust in him. He's saying if we went around and preached the gospel that Jesus is raised from the dead and if he's not raised, then our, our preaching is worthless. It has no meat to it. 
It's like me showing up to the Ducks game yes, yesterday, ready to cheer on the Ducks, and everyone's getting ready, and they're like, we have no football. You're like, well, no one brought a football? No, we can't find one. Well, what are all the teams doing here? This is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. We try to do a great thing for the fans, and there's a bunch of people wearing pink. What are we doing here for the game? I don't know. We didn't find a football. Are we going to play the game? Nope. Can't find a football. Right? We would think that would be crazy. Can't you bring the one thing, the football, if it's a football game, right? And he's saying, like, if he isn't raised from the dead, then everything we're doing here means nothing. Our worship means nothing. Because who are we worshiping? If we didn't worship the God who raises people from the dead, who raised Jesus from the dead and offers eternal life, our prayer life is worthless. Our Bible reading is worthless. Our love for one another is worthless. That's all faith. I'm, I'm trying to take faith and kind of wrap it, wrap everything in that faith package. But all that is worthless if Christ isn't raised from the dead and, and we will follow in his resurrection from the dead. I get really passionate about this because really it all rests on the resurrection. It doesn't rest on whether or not God created heavens and earth. It doesn't rest on whether or not Jesus was born on a, as a, from a virgin. Our faith doesn't rest on that. It rests on whether or not Christ was raised from the dead and is raised and living today. That's what everything revolves around for us. Otherwise, we're just, we're just sharing interesting stories. If you're going to go all in on one doctrine, it's the resurrection of Jesus. And the future resurrection of those who belong to him. We will be raised in glory to be with the Lord forever at the renewal of all things in the new heavens and the new earth. You got to go all in on that. So don't be wrong about the resurrection. It is central to the Christian faith. The second thing, don't be wrong about the resurrection. The dead will rise in bodily form. One of my favorite scholars, N.T. Wright, has been writing... (laughs) writing about um, this for like years now is like is somehow culture and art and like the medieval times has taught us that somehow we like are imbo- we are bodiless souls that float away and he's really trying in all of his writing he's trying to say no we're actually raised in new bodies we have a new bodily life after a period of being dead that's what resurrection has always meant when every- anyone ever used the term it's a- it's new embodied life after a period of of being dead So we're not going to be bodiless souls floating in the clouds. We're not disembodied spirits, right? This is not our prison. That's Plato's idea that someday when we die, then finally our soul can be released. No, that's Plato's idea. He thought that the the body was the prison of the soul holding us back. We actually will live in a new body. We need to look at Jesus. He is the model for our future body and the means by which our resurrection will come about. Remember Jesus, I don't know if you've known this, but when he returns um, to meet the disciples several times in the New Testament after his death, when he's raised in resurrection life, in his resurrection body, there's a sense in which it's, there's some continuity, right? This is Jesus. They recognize him, right? Remember when Thomas was like, I don't believe, and he was like, well, you want to see my scars? You want, you want to touch them? He reached in and touched the scars. Oh, that is you, Jesus. So he had scars. That was his body, prior to death, but now it's his resurrected body. So it's, there's some continuity, but there's also discontinuity. Jesus just arrived, showed up in the room, and they're like, wait, that's, that was weird. He's like, I'm raised. It's just, it's just different, all right? There's a different piece of glory with me now. In a way, we will be raised immortal, no longer subject to sickness and decay. How many people are excited about a resurrection body with no sickness and no decay? But it's a, it's a, it's a body, it's a, it's, a, it's a physical body, just resurrected. Again, it's hard to use different terms. And New Testament, all in a bunch of different places, will try to, to share what this means. But really, you look at Jesus, who was him, but it was a new him. He, he was able to eat with the, with the uh, disciples on the shore, and then he disappears from people. He's walking with them on the road, and then all of a sudden, he's gone. And their, their hearts were burning when they were with him. And again, it's, it's Jesus, but it's resurrected Jesus. He's now immortal, no longer subject to the death that he died. He literally died on the cross, but then he was raised to new life. Romans 8, chapter chapter 8, verse 11 and 12 says, If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies. Take your mortal body and give it life. Give it resurrection life. Make it new. Not make a new one, but make it new. All right? C.S. Lewis, I guess it's time for a C.S. Lewis quote. 
I wouldn't be a great pastor, you know, <laughs> just kidding. But C.S. Lewis, he talks about the weight of glory in the great divorce. And somehow he, he is able to, to cast this image that the humans in resurrection life will be more solid, would be more real, more substantiated than our present reality, our present bodies. This can be more real. And that's what Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 talks about, like the heaviness of glory. Is, it's, we're more real, more physical, more substantial, what we're supposed to be. The dead will rise in bodily form. And that is our hope beyond the grave. That's our hope when we, when we lay people in caskets and put them down, that one day that body will be raised and resurrected and changed and transformed and will be able to be uh, reunited with, with their spirit and live forever with the Lord in the new heavens and the new earth. And that's our hope. Because Jesus was raised, we put our hope in our future resurrection. Ultimately, don't be wrong about the resurrection is the resurrection life is not a continuation of earthly life, but a transformation into a new and glorified life. It's going to be so much better than anything we've ever experienced and so, so much more, uh, again, real. And, and, and because God will be there and he will be all and he will be in all and that will be our focus and that will be the thing that we do. We will be worshiping the Lord forever and ever. Telling him how holy he is, how good he is. I love how Paul says it in chapter 3 of Philippians. He says, Our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so they will be like his glorious body. See, the issue of the Sadducees is they were saying, like, look, hey, so whose husband is going to be her? Who, who's she going to be given to? There were seven of them. Ha, ha, we tricked you. And he's like, how dumb are you? How ignorant are you? Like, God, when he raises people to life, he doesn't just continue this, like, continue this earthly life. There's a transformation to glory, a transformation to purity, a transformation to basically Christ-likeness. It's going to be so much better. 1 Corinthians, if you're still open to 1 Corinthians 15, later on down there. Again, there's just a ton of stuff in 1 Corinthians. But in chapter 15, verse 42, it says, So it will be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown perishable, it is raised imperishable. So the body, it was died. He's talking about a kernel going down and coming up. But the body that was sown perishable, that body will come up imperishable. Not come back and continue to be perishable again, but will transform and become imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, but it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body and is raised a spiritual body. And the spiritual body means the origin does not come from the natural means, but its origin comes from God. So the transformation that happens, the glorification of the human body in resurrection life only comes from God. He is the one who does all that for us. If there's a natural body, there's also a spiritual body. So what does this mean that that the resurrection is a transformation into a a new and glorified life? That's where it comes down to being like the centerpiece of our faith is that there's hope in the midst of hopelessness. Our world screams and yearns and wants so bad to see justice come on this earth. And the only time in which we know that things will actually be made right are at the resurrection when Jesus returns and transforms our lowly bodies into Again, spiritual bodies. When he, when he takes us and he, and he gives us bodies of glory just like his and he, he sets the world right. And so the things that, that hinder us because of the hopelessness and the desperations will actually finally be made right. And that all happens at the resurrection. When all this junk, all the things in this world will finally be made right and true justice will reign because the Prince of Peace will actually be the King of Kings and Lord of Lords ruling over it all. And now there's hope for our relationships to be profoundly deeper than they ever are now. 
Again, I don't think of the resurrection, we don't recognize people we know. That would just go totally contrary to like the love and the, and the mutual affection in Christ that we've shared with people. We've partnered in the gospel with people. We've built relationships here. And if we say those relationships are eternal, then in the, in the resurrection life, our relationships will be profoundly deeper. Will they be a continuation of the life now? No. But I think they will be transformed to be deeper and to be filled with more glory. They will be without, um, again, without sin, without pain. So I am a believer that, that we will know people in the afterlife. It makes only sense for how much we depend on our relationships now, how much we would then see people and understand them. Because remember, the point of the story was they're not given in marriage to populate anymore, but now we are there to worship the Lord forever. So as we think about today and we, and we walk out, my big charge to you is don't be wrong about the resurrection. It is the thing in which we have our hope and trust because Jesus is raised from the dead. The promise is true for those who have their faith in him that they will be raised from the dead at his return. Will you pray with me this morning? Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for who you are. And we thank you for the power of your response to the Sadducees in this passage. The way in which you stress the conviction in the resurrection. Lord, we do believe and we proclaim as a church that you are raised from the dead and you are alive forevermore. And Lord, we put our hope in the fact that you will raise us when you return. Lord, remind us that resurrection is is the end of our story if we are in you. And with eyes closed, if there's people in the room who just, today you want to make that declaration, make that decision for Christ to say, I, I, I want to put my faith and trust in him, and I want to experience the hope that only comes in the resurrection. Would you just raise your hand? I just want to, just want to celebrate with you the decision to say yes for Jesus and to walk forward in that. I see your hand. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. So God... We just worship you, and we do. We place our full trust in the fact that you are raised, and we proclaim it. Help us to to walk out of here living the resurrection life now as we wait for the fullness to come. And we can only do that in the power of your spirit. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, church, we need candy. I think you heard that, but... But uh, on your way out today, why don't you say hi to somebody who's no longer ignorant, all right, about the resurrection. So we'll see you next week.